Chapter 15 Rafe T.G. Mako strutted the empty streets feeling good. He was packing serious heat. He had a good buzz on from sampling the latest shipment, and he had a hot new bitch waiting for him. All was right with the world. He looked up, smiling. The sky was still thick with smog and summer heat, but Rafe didn't really give a fuck about the weather. He felt too good to let that worry him. The building seemed to dance against the dirty sky as he walked, a combination of his footsteps and something in the drugs playing with his mind, and he loved it. The whole damn city danced to his tune all right. Word was out on the street that Lamb was dead, and Carr had lost some of his best boys, and that meant that there were opportunities to be had, room to move up, and Rafe intended to find himself some space at the top, somewhere he could rake in the big money, get himself a place to live in that looked like a goddamn Hollywood movie set, take his women two at a time. Something flickered overhead, leaping from one building to the next, and Rafe blinked. His steps slowed. Wasn't anything up there, man. He thought he'd seen something. Just a bit of hot air, he told himself, or a fart from some car's exhaust, playing tricks with his eyes in the heat. He strolled on, but just to reassure himself, just to scare off any fools that might be on the roof planning something, he pulled out the Uzi he'd scored, pulled it out and checked to make sure it was loaded and held it out pointed at the sky while he looked along the rooftops. Heat shimmered along the sunlit parapets, in one spot in particular, and Rafe stared at it. He could see through it, no question. He could see the chimney behind it. So it wasn't really there, unless the stuff he'd taken was giving him goddamn x-ray vision. That shape was nothing, just a trick of the light, a side effect of the drug. But hey, real or not, he didn't need to let it bother him. He fired a burst, three rounds, and sure enough, the shimmer was gone. Rafe smiled. Wasn't anything going to mess with him, man. Something thumped on the sidewalk behind him, and he turned, startled. Wasn't anything there, but the air was shimmering, just a few feet away. He looked to see if there was a grating or a vent or something where hot air might be coming up, but it was over a solid sidewalk. Shit, he said. This had to be the drug, messing with his head. This wasn't good. He didn't like this. They must have cut it with something weird, those bastards who sold it to him. Then the shimmer moved, and something slashed across his chest, something he couldn't see, and he looked down at the twin red slits in his microfiber shirt, red on the blue fabric, and it sank in that red was coming out of him. It was blood. Something had cut him. The pain couldn't penetrate the haze of drugs, but he was cut, he could see it and feel it. He swung the Uzi and sprayed the street with bullets, but didn't hit anything, and he was scared now. There wasn't anything there, so what had cut him? He turned, looking for his attacker, and a pair of blades plunged into his back, one on either side of his spine. He flexed once, horribly, and the Uzi flew from his hand to land rattling on the sidewalk, then he slumped and hung limply from an invisible claw. The blade slashed upwards, cutting through ribs. A few moments later, a boy turned the corner and spotted the shape lying in the sidewalk in a puddle of something red. A drunk, lying in spilled wine? Wine wasn't that red. Paint, maybe. He edged closer. Oh shit, he said. It wasn't a drunk. Drunks have heads. This guy didn't. Something had ripped his head right off. The boy inched away, then noticed something else lying nearby. <laughs> awesome, he said, as he snatched up the Uzi. He looked both ways. No one had seen him, unless it was some nosy old woman looking out of a window somewhere. This was a fine weapon here. Should be worth a hundred bucks or more. He took the gun and ran. Five minutes after that, a woman found the body and ran screaming into the deli in the next block. The man behind the counter called the cops. When the body had been loaded into the meat wagon, Officer Brownlow glanced at his partner. Think this is one for the feds? he asked. Ortiz looked up from his notepad. What, the feds? he said. What for? You know, that special bunch with the notices? Brownlow said. They said they wanted to know about any really bizarre killings. They said bodies hung upside down and people skinned and like that, Ortiz said. 
They said people with guns. You see any guns here? Some shell casings back there. So someone dropped them. And I don't see no guns. And nobody's got skinned or nothing. Got his head pulled off. You call that bizarre? Come on. They turn a guy inside out. Maybe I'd call that bizarre. Those feds, man, they're too busy for us to bother them with every little detail. Too fucking busy with their own goddamn shooting range they sealed off. Too goddamn busy poking their noses into our business. No, man. I don't want to tell them about this one any more than Lieutenant Thomas told them about the two last night. Brownlow nodded. Just making sure we understood each other, he said, tucking his own notebook away. And at Kennedy International, General Phillips told his aide, It's just Schaefer thereafter. Otherwise, there'd be more killings by now. And later that night, when Phillips' plane was somewhere over the Gulf of Mexico, word reached Carr that someone had taken down Mako and kept his head for a souvenir. Shit, he said. It took an effort not to blow away the smirking son of a bitch who brought the news, but Carr resisted the temptation. Besides, it wasn't as much fun with this wussy 38 he was carrying. He'd lost his 357 back on Beekman Street, and he was still royally pissed about that too. He'd get another, but he hadn't got around to it yet. He'd been busy with more important shit. Like these killings, TG Maker wasn't the first. He wasn't even the second. Carr had been thinking that TG might take over Edgy's old post, and now Mako was just as dead as Edgy. Shit, Carr said again. Someone was out there cutting down the baddest dudes around, except for Carr himself, of course, who'd been missed in that first big throwdown. Word on the street was that whoever was at it had hit a bunch of cops too, so it wasn't the feds or the cops deciding to screw the rules and get serious. The self-proclaimed good guys wouldn't play that rough, not even if every cop who'd gone down turned out to be on the take. But it might be some bunch of road cops out on their own, it might be that son of a bitch Schaefer and some of his buddies. He was crazy enough to try something like this, Carr thought. He denied it, but that didn't mean shit. After the first massacre, Carr had figured out it was a one-time thing. Something meant to scare the crap out of him, put the fear of God out on the streets, and he'd gone back home and tried to get back to business as usual. Tried to put together the leadership he needed to run the whole goddamn show, now that that wimp lamb was meat on a slab. He'd wanted to make sure none of the survivors in Lamykin's bunch got ideas about picking up where Lamb left off. They were his boys now. He didn't need fresh competition. But then someone had iced Tony Blue, ripped his head off in a loft on St. Mark's. And someone got QQ at his woman's place on Avenue B, and his head was gone too. And there were people saying it was Carr's boys, finishing off Lamb's gang. And others who said it was one of Lamb's punks who was trying to show how tough he was. That didn't explain the first massacre, or the reports of dead cops though. Carr didn't know who the hell it was, or why, but he knew one thing. He had to stop it. He wasn't going to be able to do any normal business, wasn't going to be able to get things straightened out, until it stopped. So he stopped worrying about business. He started lining up muscle. Sooner or later the killers were going to screw up, and Carr would find out who they were. When that happened, he intended to come down on them hard, take them all out in one big hit. To do that, he needed the baddest men in the city. Not just his own people, not a regular gang, but muscle he could call on once for this one job. He needed to have them standing by ready to move on a moment's notice. He started compiling a list of phone numbers. His own boys, the toughest of lamb survivors, uptown muscle who didn't mind a little freelance work, Hardcore muscle from out on the island. Serious bad news from all five boroughs. Maybe it was Schaefer. Maybe it was the Colombians. Maybe it was someone else. Carr didn't care. When he found out who it was, he'd be ready. <laughs>